Welcome to the Flawed Workshop Podcast with me, your host, Nancy Art Music. And me, your co-host, Alex Roberts. We'll be looking at me and my story today. So my endeavours and, uh, I suppose, trials and tribulations that go along with uh, the creative processes that I've been on in my journey mm. and in my life. So. You can tell us how difficult it is to be a writer because it looks quite hard. People, A lot of people say that. It's... Um, it's easier than it looks, but at the same time, that's only when you're writing. Uh, it's everything else that's really difficult. I guess when people think of writers, maybe a lot of people consider themselves that way because of social media and stuff, like mm, all yeah. them Twitter comedians who aren't actually really funny. I, I, I feel that was a slightly personal attack on me there, but... What? Why? <laughs> some, 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 some of my tweets are funny. You know, I used to send haikus to uh, the rail provider when uh, the trains were <laughs> disrupted or cancelled. Really? <laughs> yeah, and there was, there was a spate where it was about eight days, eight work days in a row where all of my trains were cancelled or delayed and um, was just sending them haikus about being cold and wet stood on a platform. Were they emotionally driven enough that they felt the they, need to... They never replied, but I did uh, I did gain a few Twitter followers from... Uh, from either other people stood on the, uh, stood on the platform or uh, some haiku enthusiasts. Wow. What Be- a niche group of people. <laughs> I, I think I found all four of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we've been together eight years and then some. And then... Yep, coming up to nine years. And the entire time you've been writing things, uh, whether it's songs or poetry or really creepy, creepy, creepy short stories. I've always known you to be writing. Mm-hmm. Um but I don't really know how you got to where you are now all the way. So tell, okay. tell us about that, why don't you? Um, so I started writing proper when I was probably 14, 15. I can't quite remember which. And like many angst-riddled teenagers, I vividly remember the day I came home from school. I was sat at my desk uh, in my room, sort of the door closed and music pounding and blaring. And, you know, it wasn't anything like decent music at all. It was it was all pop punk angst. I mean, that's so subjective. Um, we don't bash any it, type of creativity on even, this even podcast. The, even their merch says crappy pop punk. I mean, if they're it's, self-defined that it's, way. You know, it's, yeah, it's there's nothing fine. more we can Look, do about it, it. it. It's who I am. I've got to live with it. <laughs> um, and I, anyway, so on this day, I um, was, there was a scrap of paper on my desk, uh, sort of uh, amongst all of the uh, the folders and files and homework that I hadn't done and things. Um, I just wrote down some words. And I read them and I was like, oh, that was that was pretty good. And like the, the words kind of rhymed and they had flow to them. And that was the first time I really realized that I was writing poetry or something that could be perceived as poetry. Mm. So would you say poetry is your main source of creative outlet? It would depend entirely on the situation. I would say that poetry is the one that I tend to fall into naturally when it comes to giving myself a respite from the real world or trying to go through um, emotions. So if there's something that's been happening or I'm stressed out, something like that, uh, I will quite often find myself writing things that end up becoming poetry or are immediately uh, the the basis of a poem. Mm. There's something very magical about the way when you do it right, when there's a poem that can convey an entire story in a handful of lines and you can almost imagine the world that it's in or the character and their entire backstory in perhaps eight lines is that's sort of what I keep what I aim for when I'm actively thinking about being a poet and sort of reaching those heights. But when it comes to the meditative side of the creative outlet, mm. I, I think you kind of you probably understand what I'm on about with that. It's mm, that when mm. you find yourself in the zone, in the flow, in the flow, in the zone, mm. all that sort of thing. It t- it tends to be short stories mostly. On that yeah, one. I guess that's. I don't know if everybody finds that, but even though visual art isn't really... I mean, I think all art is about storytelling to some degree, Mm, but I feel like if you think of a story, naturally it it comes out more as just Mm. like a story as opposed to poetry, if that makes sense. Well, to me anyway. But you're... Yeah, I I, I get what you mean. It's... um, I mean, I'm quite envious of a lot of visual artists because I'm not very good at visual art Mm. at all. I can do... Uh, a cartoon pig is like my go-to drawing. <laughs> you know the one I'm on about, yeah. I uh, can't remember. The one with his face on and... Uh, I'm sure you'll draw it. Yeah. I'll, I'll draw it for you later, yeah. 
Um, I can do that, and I can sort of sketch out a 3D-looking cube on some maths paper. Aw, classic. Um, classic school-time doodles. Oh, and that, that, um, uh, that thing where you uh, sort of make the really gangster-looking S. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's about as far as my, my visual art goes. But when I, can, when I see something that someone has drawn or painted or designed, you know, and it conveys an entire story or an emotion and things, that, oh, I'm very, very in awe of that. Going full circle from that, was then the case where, unbeknownst to me, uh, my some of my poetry that I had shared confidentially had been shared again with uh, a family friend who was a visual artist who was so inspired by it that she then reached out to me to say, hey, I've drawn these based on your poems mm. because they inspired me and this is the vision they gave me. And it was this realisation that suddenly, oh, it's a two-way road. Hang on. Um, so... I can see things and I get inspired to either write a poem, write a story, or incorporate it in some way, the imagery and that sort of thing. Or uh, it goes the other way around and something I have created has inspired someone else in their creative endeavours. So you didn't think that your work could inspire others? or I mean, I guess no, you it, were it, writing for yourself. It, it was more that I just didn't even consider that as a thing. Um, oh, okay. It was, I, at, at this point, I, I wasn't publicising or sharing any of my work, uh, only with a few select people, sort of you know, family members or closest friends. Mm. This, this has been going on for, for years until I was sort of in my early 20s. But the idea that something I had created could then be used to inspire others or collaborate with others was something that hadn't really ever crossed my mind. I don't know if it was maybe the case that I sort of didn't consider myself good enough or mm. the idea that to inspire someone else, you must be a professional at something. Yeah, I can see from having known you that mm. that's something that you would have assumed because even yes. now yeah. i feel like you've said that you it's finding your work can be itself like it stands alone and so it's yeah. difficult i feel like you found it difficult sometimes to say that oh this is uh, you know this but it can oh, also definitely. turn into something else and people can mm. kind of use it in their own sense to to elaborate on it i guess i suppose the the best example of that i've got is actually from the music side of things that i have done before mm. so back at university uh, i was in a band i've been playing guitar and bass uh, for years and years uh, since i was what, 14 15 uh, about the same time as since i started writing when i sort of really found myself creatively mm. and when we would be at a band practice or songwriting and things like that, people would come to the, you know, one of us would come to the table with an idea of something. Then the idea of sharing it was, first of all, terrifying to begin with. Yeah. Uh, we, we had a song called Silence and I had written this, this bass intro to it, but I had no idea what the guitar could sound like over the top of it or anything. Mm. And sharing it with people, it, you know, something then became created that was better than I could have ever done. Mm. Um, or at least I think that I could have ever done. And it was so outside of my concept of what the song could sound like. Mm. Yeah. I suppose it's probably the best way of putting it. And it was at that point, it was realizing, oh, hey, collaboration and sharing can be really, really good at this. Yeah. Do you think that with music, mm. I guess easier is not the word, but mm. do you think that music lends itself better to collaboration than something like writing or poetry or short stories do? I, I would say in most cases, and it, it probably is easier as well, just from a, a logical point of view. You know, um, if, I'm in, if I'm playing music, I can't play piano. So if I wanted the piano involved, then I would need to get someone that can play piano. Mm. Um, that's a very simple form of collaboration. And then it would be letting them work their magic on you know the stem of my idea. When it comes to writing and collaboration, I haven't found much success or things that I've totally enjoyed where it's been a case of we've shared a writing project. Mm. So it would be, oh, you write, a, you write something, I'll write something, we'll mash them together, see what happens. I don't find that works well for me personally. Yeah, I'm baffled but, by people who can do that because uh, it feels yeah. so personal. Yeah, when, when you end up reading a book that's been written by about three people or when you take apart a script that's been written by a handful of people mm. and it still flows so magnificently and they're they are so on the same page and I, i'm certain there's a, a hell of a lot of editing that goes into it and mm -hmm. yeah. arguments over certain things but the best way i've experienced from the collaboration side with writing is either just asking for direct feedback from people mm. that you either trust or respect or are trying to emulate That's in terrifying. the industry. 
It is terrifying. The first time you do it is heart wrenching. <laughs> it's. Um, do you feel yeah. like? Uh, well, I, I felt this way with some of the things mm. that. Well, when when I was doing music, I felt this way when I would show someone something on the very rare occasion that happened. But do you feel like it completely changes how it comes across when you show it to somebody? I don't know if it completely changes it because it's something I created and it came from an emotion, it came from a memory, it came from a place or an experience or a thought that I was you know, putting down into my own creative form. So that stays the entire time. I don't ever lose that. You don't get um, self conscious when you. Oh, have God, it oh yeah, but that's a different that's a different topic completely. Oh, okay. but when you pass it to someone who then, particularly with poetry, who completely interprets it in a different way and is able to explain why to you, and mm. you can see that you, th- you you suddenly realize just how much of an impact words and work can have on people in more ways than you would ever imagine. Mm. And I'm sure if you know a million people read some some of my poems or something like that or a short story, they would get the different you know different conclusions, different morals from it. Yeah, um, that I had not experienced or thought of. It's really nice to <laughs> actually hear you say that yeah. because I feel like again we we know each other quite well. We're about to get married. Blah blah blah. I I, I feel yeah I feel we're beyond you know sort of acquaintances at this point. <laughs> it's been very. Like amazing watching you be. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, just leave it there. We'll we'll end it there. That's fine. Just amazing watching me. That's fine. Just, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been really great having uh, watching you kind of accept that you've been able to do something that I've been very jealous of. Mm. Like you've been able to let go of your work mm. and let people interpret it. I've never been able to do that. I want. Well, I always want my work to be very clear, or if it's ambiguous, mm. I want it intentionally to be ambiguous, and that's really like so scary for me. I think a lot of that actually ties in very nicely with this idea of trying to do creative things whilst doing a regular job. Mm. And for a lot of my regular jobs in, in recent years, it has been based around editorial and content creation yeah. for businesses and individuals, um, speeches, presentations, all that sort of stuff. And... Not a day goes by where I don't get something given back to me that has got amendments to it or edits to it or changes to it. And it's not that they're telling me that I'm bad at what I'm doing. Mm. It's that they have got their own interpretations of it as well. And it was learning that step Mm. was a really big eye-opening experience for me. And it's very difficult to do because the first few times so my first editorial job when something came back across my desk i can still remember it it had it been through two different proofreaders and editorial staff it was covered in green and pink pen Mm. um and if they're listening to this i'm sure they know exactly who they are because they (laughs) they use those pens but uh it was really refreshing because it wasn't the case that they were there saying no you're bad at this you're doing it wrong it was, first of all, they were more experienced than I was, so I could learn from that. Mm. But also, they were reading it in a way that I wasn't. So did, do you find that different? I mean, uh, whereas, you, whereas for me, I mm. haven't incorporated my creative pursuits into my sort of nine-to-five job, mm. you've managed and you've like strived to do that. Striven? Strived. Stro- stro- strove. Strove. Stro- stroven. You've stroven to um, yeah. basically pursue an element of your creative career in your regular nine to five job. So yes. was that more or less difficult? I mean, you have to be your own editor when you're coming to creative work because you don't mm. have a team behind you trying to develop your vision. If no, and unfortunately, sense. I can't afford anyone. Else, but uh. <laughs> but um, I don't know. Is there more of a disconnect with your uh, work that isn't creative? Or I guess it is creative, mm. but not in the sense that it's coming from like pouring out the soul, that kind of thing. Okay. When yeah, somebody yeah. changes that <laughs> versus, I mean, if you're writing an um, article about something that you're not personally connected to versus a poem that you've written, mm. Those are two different things to present to people. Very, very different. Um, the, the the first thing, uh, particularly in my current job where I'm in um, PR and communications, is that there is someone else on the receiving end of whatever I'm creating and writing that is, first of all, paying me, mm. which completely changes the dynamic of it. But also, I suppose, the reputation of not only myself, but my colleagues and the business I work for is also resting on it. Mm. And... To then further complicate matters, working for so many different individuals or businesses, each one of them has their own individual tone, their own specialisms, their own niches, and each one 
is different to the next. Mm. So it it has taken me, and I'm still learning it. It's, it's still taken a long time to find those voices as opposed to using my voice. Mm. And that is a big, big difference. My voice still does come across. You know, they, um, they are more than happy for me to put things in and interpret things in my own way. Um, but ultimately, I'm there to write for them and represent them. Mm. Um, but do you find that criticism is different with that work versus your own creative work, like your poetry, your short stories? Um, I, I, I would joke that it's a lot more stressful when you get it at work because you realize that there's money hanging on it. And then when it comes to the personal stuff, you just take it as a, as a, a slander and uh, just people just having a go at you. Mm-hmm. But. Well, yeah, I guess you take it personally. That makes total sense. Yeah, it's like, oh, come on, man, I'm not even being paid for this. I came to, mm-hmm. I came to you as a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's it's definitely different. There, there, there is a whole dynamic to it, but I'm trying my best to develop my creative endeavours on a personal front into the business, and I'm trying to approach it all with a, you know, a larger grain of salt of, of business to it. I would, I would say that I'm trying my best to bring about... Uh, a level of professionalism to my own creations, but it's finding that balance of, oh, I'm doing this because I'm a creative and it's my art and it's my experiences and emotions. Um, I suppose that probably comes across more with the poetry and things. Mm. Um, But I am far better and far more open to sharing it with people now. Yeah. Do you Mm. mind on that note, if Mm. I share with people how the poetry collection came about? Um, As long as you try not to take as much credit for it as I think you're going to try and take. I'm not going to. I'm just going to tell it like I think it is. You you tell it like you you think it is and then I will come in and correct you. Absolutely. You you are entitled to correct me because it's about your stuff. Okay. I mean, I wrote it. So I started off with writing individual poems and I had started from the age... Yes, you did. That's correct. Yeah. Started from the age of 14 (laughs) or 15 and I had been writing regularly and consistently for years and years and years um, until I started university and kept on going. When I then realized I basically had a chronological diary of loads of events and parts and moments of my life which were written as verse which was pretty unusual for a teenage boy, mm. um, I think. So it's, a, it's a, a unique insight in that regard. And then I met you, yeah. and I had shared a load of these with you. Mm-hmm. And I had written some stuff for you as well, which you hate and cringe at. And I I cringe at some of them now as well. But that's kind of the joy of it, though. Uh, yeah, it's so, always fun to, uh, to cringe and reflect on your yeah. old art. <laughs> yeah, um, there's nothing wrong with having things that you sort of just let them make you go... <sighs> Oh, mm-hmm. you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just that they were so intimate and they're in the poetry collection. So don't read those, by the <laughs> way. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, then I just sat on them for a long period of time because I was, I'll, I'll say why, I was nervous and scared and I hadn't reached that point in my creative process where I was able to willingly share and put myself out on a limb mm-hmm. until you came along. That was very, like, difficult. I think you still struggle with it, which uh, is super annoying for me because I've told you how amazing you are at writing and so have other people. I've got saved screenshots in my favorites thing on my phone of people that have commented on stuff. Um, Okay, so do you remember the short story about the end of the world that I did? Yeah, super terrifying. You you read it and you were genuinely crying at the end of it. It was scary as hell, yeah. Yeah. So I sent that to a friend of mine and she replied, uh, you know, an hour or so later after she had read it or whatever, uh, just with the comment of, that was genuinely the most realistic interpretation of en- of like endless love that I have ever experienced. That's, yeah. And I was like, yes, I've nailed it. Oh God, I've bummed out my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's... And that, yeah. that was what was so annoying for me. It was really annoying for me as a person who loves you to watch you not to mm. want to... I felt like you want to share these things because obviously I feel like mm. you were writing them for you. Yeah. But... I know how much other people could have benefited from yeah. uh, doing it because obviously it being a chronological diary, you were experiencing things that other people mm-hmm. are experiencing at the same time, but some people don't know how to articulate that and you could yeah. do that. And for me personally, I was annoyed that you weren't sharing this with people. Yeah. So. Oh, that came across. Yeah, that was, that, that was uh, obvious. Yeah. And obviously you were doing this for me because you were saying for my music, like, 
all you, you know, you have all these ideas, blah, blah, blah. Mm. So we were both doing this for each other, but you actually had the content to back it up. You had poetry. <laughs> I, I had I, dreams I, I, and wishes. I, I, I didn't have the ego where I was just like, I've already written in my head. It's fine. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. see, but this is so much more valuable. And- anyway, on to the next point. So you went out of your way to basically compile my work into I, yeah. into a first draft collection. Because you were already doing some of it and you were you were kind know, of I, keeping yeah. it on the down low because so otherwise I, I would have had to take every single poem and paste so, it into a Word document. Okay. And I don't have the time to do so that. I, I, so I made you do it. <laughs> I had already written an introduction. I had written a yeah the introduction and sort of the preface and compiled everything into an order and it just sat on my laptop for a while. Yeah, um, a long time. Until yeah. Christmas. I think it was Christmas, but I didn't get it in time for your birthday. I didn't get it made until your birthday. Yeah, so it was a belated Christmas present. Yeah, so. very belated. <laughs> oh, that is in February. It's not that belated. Yeah. So. But I reached out to a book printing company who basically printed, was it either 50 or 100 copies? I can't remember which. I basically thought that it would be a good idea for you to be able to see your Mm -hmm. entire poetry collection as something that people could have in their hands. Because, of course, you wrote a lot of it on a laptop or some of it was transferred if it was handwritten (laughs) digitally. Yes, yeah, everything ended up on the laptop, although some of it was written on the back of receipts and things, Mm -hmm. you know. And so I thought if you could see it in book form, Mm -hmm. that would help to Mm -hmm. kind of make it tangible. The book was made... (laughs) And I pre- I presented it to you, and I asked you to editorialize it and mm-hmm. make it make the formatting good mm-hmm. and stuff. And you put it out in the world. And once you started sharing it, what was everybody's feedback? Um, so there was phenomenal feedback. Um, uh, unsurprisingly, there was uh, some you know support from my family and things. You know. <laughs> Um, you know, I I know I'm their favorite anyway, so it's yeah, it, it wasn't really a surprise that they were like, oh, so proud of you. You joke but about this. I do but joke you're about so this. No, lucky I, to have that. yeah, I, I yeah, yeah. But um, the the initial run sold out, mm-hmm. so I managed to uh, sell each book individually mm-hmm. um, and personally signed. I think I signed pretty much all of them as well, actually. So there's a sort of a, the limited run of the very first pressing of my book is most of them are signed. If um, uh, any of you wants a copy, too bad. But if uh, <laughs> if you end up being a mega famous writer and they become sought after mm-hmm. items, they don't have a, a barcode on the back. And that's how you know you have an original. They don't have a barcode and they don't have anything on the spine either. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, um, but I started getting some really strong feedback from people that I hadn't ever met in my life who had just ordered a copy. The, the one that always sticks in my mind was um, someone who bought a copy of my poetry book and she gave it to her son, and unbeknownst to me. Mm. And a little bit of context, a, a lot of this poetry is written prior to me being diagnosed with anxiety and depression. Mm. And then once I got that diagnosis, it's 20, 21. 20, mm. Yeah. Um, suddenly you know, all these things started to make sense of like, oh, so that was a panic attack I had at eight. <laughs> you know? But anyway, she gave it to her son after hearing from me what it was about and things. He then got in touch with me about two weeks after the fact, and he had read everything cover to cover and he had doodled all over it highlighted bits there were notes all over the pages mm. he just basically saying you have uh, managed to explain what i'm feeling and he, he was a few years younger than me at the time so i think he was 15 16 as it was happening so pretty much as i was writing all these angsty things he was coming across and saying actually that is exactly how i feel and that made everything very very different and added this this realization of wow i can really make a difference to someone in a positive way i i love that and i always knew you could so um you know just saying so yeah so that was the first sort of big plunge that i took when it came to my personal writing uh, particularly very personal writing i had sent some things off to poetry competitions and short story competitions mm. i'd managed to get a couple of pieces in uh, some anthologies that were being made um but this was the first time it was uh, everything's on me spotlights on me mm. and you you know i don't really enjoy the spotlight being on me all that much yeah um and that's that's just kind of who i am as a person but oh it felt good yeah. It felt good. Of course. And now I'm uh I've I've just put together the uh second draft well the f- second draft? Yeah, second draft of my second anthology, a collection. That so, is so cool. Yeah, and this one's completely different. So now on to hmm. the 
Uh, my favorite question, I think, mm -hmm. which is going to be uh, of the podcast <laughs> generally. Okay. Uh, what are your struggles and what, like, what are your big flaws when it comes to like trying to maintain mm -hmm. your creative outlet and your creative career? Because mm -hmm. from my perspective, I think, and on the outside also looks like you're doing really well because... I'm like, you're doing your nine to five, you come home, you write a little bit, you know, you put out an Instagram post every single day still? No, 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 I haven't done that for a while. Um, it, it was the case that I'm, I'm actually doing 150 days in a row of a daily post. That's incredible. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you still manage to write short stories and stuff hmm. on the weekend. But obviously, because I know yeah. you personally, I hear you say, I don't think I've done enough. Okay, so the, the, there's a lot to unpack there. So the first thing is... Uh, one of the big creative struggles that I have experienced with writing is what I would call feast and famine. Oh, okay. Um, so you, it's, it's waiting for that moment of oh, the inspiration has hit me and I must write everything now. And you'll go for seven hours nonstop. Mm. Um, and that's feasting. And then you'll go weeks not doing it because you're saying to yourself, oh, I'm just not inspired. I'm not in the mood. And that's mm. the famine. Gosh, that's terrible. Um, I heard uh, what, someone I was talking to about this once uh, described it as uh, you're a writer, not a waiter. Mm. Um, you know, you can't wait on yourself to be inspired and do it. You've got to write. Yeah. I mean, um, I've been trying to act yeah. as your manager. The only reason I feel like I'm qualified is because I endlessly watch videos on productivity mm. and creative careers. I mean, and so I'm regurgitating all this information at you. And we we tried to do this like scheduled daily writing thing. Yeah, the schedule thing works for about two weeks, I think mm. it was. Uh, but then other stresses and things in life, it sort of became a bit untenable, was actually detrimental. Yeah. I think. But yeah, it's I, very important to find a balance. Yeah, if something isn't work, don't don't working, don't force it. I suppose the the other side that you were talking about is problems I'm having uh, or have had is mm. just having the bravery to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. And that is bad enough by itself. I still get it now constantly, almost every single thing I put out, but I have to actively think back to how good it felt mm -hmm. previous times, even when I got criticism for yeah. things. Um, I, I've written some things that came across as clumsy or were interpreted in the wrong way or just didn't land mm. properly or they just had no impact at all. Um, and people have come back and said, even you, you've gone eh, to a lot of things I've done before or yeah. just like, you know, and th there's nothing wrong with that because that's how you grow mm -hmm. and it's having the ability to first of all be brave enough to put yourself out there because not everyone does yeah and to recognize that and to then take it a step further and say well i can actually work on myself i can work on this mm. i can evolve it i can develop it yeah even now when i go back and read a load of the poems that are in the first collection some of them in there just make me want to curl up and die um, <laughs> but i wouldn't change them for anything because that's no. how it was at the time and the the things i'm writing now i feel have definitely matured they're, they're far more rounded and, and developed uh, i know i've used that word a lot but that's mm. the only way to describe it really is it's uh yeah you you grow and you I, change I, over time i've gone from uh building sand castles to now utilizing that sand to start glass blowing but <gasps> uh, i've made my first my first bubble in glass mm. um not nowhere close to making a chandelier or anything yet but, yeah yeah you know but i've taken the raw ingredients that's there and started making it into something bigger and better mm -hmm. but the, the final thing is definitely remembering that this is supposed to be fun yeah anytime i've written something that i have forced myself to write and this is where the the daily writing thing fell down mm-hmm there were a few things in there that we did that I, well, sorry, that we did, that I did, uh, that you forced me to do. That, um, <laughs> I'm glad that, you see me yeah. as involved in your process. <laughs> oh God, you're terrifying as a manager. Good. Um, there were a few in there that came out and evolved into something that I used later on for something bigger or brighter. One of those being an actual short story that uh, I've written, mm. um, which uh, I've had fantastic feedback to. And everyone has said, why the hell have you written this? Yeah. Um, it's well, I think a lot of your work is very confusing because i feel like uh, although you mm. have a very dark sense of humor because it's humor it's disarming yeah. but your genuine stories like your short stories and your poetry is from this like serious and genuine place mm. and they're very unsettling because they're very <laughs> there are some big things naked is Ooh, okay. such a like it's mm. the perfect word to describe it because Raw. yeah well not, not 
not no even raw. raw. Yeah. Okay. I guess I personally find the word more associated with like meats, like raw chicken. It's mm. not, it doesn't evoke feeling in me, but like to <laughs> feel naked. Yeah. It's so exposed. Without, yeah. Without, yeah. Exposed. It, and, okay. and, you know, it's terrifying to feel that way by just reading some words. Mm. And, and the fact that you have, this is why, you know, I want you to do good and stuff. Um, and this is why I want other people to do good and stuff because they, lots of people, more people mm. than I thought have this basis. Yeah. I want you and everybody else to understand that it's worth doing and it's so scary. And I'm so gl glad that you've been able to do what you've been able to do so far. I'm super excited. It, in hindsight. Yeah, me too. Um, it's definitely the case of, I don't want to look back in, you know, when I'm mid thirties and go, Oh, I wish I did it then. Mm. I would much rather put it out there now, get shot down and fail mm. and bounce back stronger. Like there's no shame in failure. There's very few downsides to failure, to you be honest. You have to fail so many times to get good. And yeah. this is one of those things that I saw in my productivity video binge watching on YouTube is that <laughs> all the people that are successful have failed tons and tons of times at lots of different mm. things before they got to where they are. And because their success is the shiniest, yeah. that's the thing that people pay most attention to. But And this is why we've also made this podcast, because we want to make the less shiny things more known. Mm. Everybody goes through those, because it's very difficult to see everybody doing what they're doing and be like, yeah. I should be doing that. You, you and I are very lucky and fortunate in the fact that we've got each other on a daily basis to bounce off of, and we're mm. both creative in different ways. Mm -hmm. The struggle that a lot of people or friends that I've got have is either they don't have that confidence that you and I have in each other mm. to either get the critiques or get the enthusiasm and the support yeah. that we want to be developing through this podcast. Yeah. And creative careers in themselves are sort of something that people don't think like society mm. doesn't value them despite the last year proving no. that we need this I'm... stuff to keep us alive and sane. <laughs> I think, I think it's changing a lot. It's, um, it used to be the case of, uh, oh, you've gone to do an art degree, oh, uh, 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 you know, 15, 20 years ago. But now it's getting to the stage where people are realizing that it's the quality and the value that you find in items and, and things mm. that make everything else worthwhile. And it's the creative arts, whether it's going to the theater or the cinema or listening to an orchestra yeah, uh, and those one-on-one -on -one experiences, or even just down at Covent Garden, one of the, the street performers that are down there, finding one of them. Is, there's so much creativity and love out there and it's finding the value in it and then realizing that you need to put a livelihood on it mm -hmm. um, and it's paying that it's worth. So Although you're buying a piece of artwork, you're not paying for that one piece of art. You're paying for the 10,000 hours the artist put yeah. into it. And this is why I love... Mm -hmm. Uh, I both love and hate. I like, I like, I hate how many times I've seen this as a meme and stuff like that. Um, but I love the fact that I am seeing it so much at the same time because it just means that it's getting shared enough where people commission people for logos or designs yeah. or a jingle or, you know, help me work mm. on my website. And they're like, oh, my nephew can do it for free. And then everyone, like the artists that they've, they've been quote unquote trying to hire, mm -hmm. not really even hire trying to suck value out of without getting, you know, yeah. giving them anything in return. They are now getting put on blast because it's so stupid. You cannot <laughs> expect people to just do work for you for free. Like, yeah, it's fun. Like, can you imagine, like, going to a supermarket? Like, okay, mm. you know, you can buy those little play sets for kids that are supermarkets. And yep. they sometimes make a beep noise because there's little magnets in them. Yep. That kid, let's say he grows up and he wants to work at a, uh, like a supermarket. And he's like, oh, God, this is so much fun. My soul is filled with joy because I'm checking out people's items in the supermarket. I am really important. I can do this. Just because that guy likes his mm -hmm. job doesn't mean it's not like he doesn't deserve to get paid for it. He's yeah. not going to go home and eat the joy that he got that day and then <laughs> tell his landlord like, hey, landlord, what up? I was so happy today getting people their supermarket goods. The landlord's going to be like, oh my God, that's so great. Like yeah. live in this house for free because you're so happy. That's so no. dumb. I don't understand what... The anyway, sorry, this is a you, rant. Yeah, well, how about we come on to a, a sort of finding finding your value and, <sighs> and pricing your value? I have been Nancy Art Music. You can follow me on TikTok and... And Instagram at Nancy Art Music. Alex, where can we find you? I'm Alex Roberts, and you can find me on Instagram at 
Alex Roberts Writer, mm-hmm. and you can find my first collection of poetry, Empire, on Amazon. Thank you so much for listening. Tune in next week, where we are joined by our first ever guest, Georgie, also known as Chibi Ace, who is an illustrator and also working in the games industry. See you next week! <laughs>